Ghanaians prepare for the polls tomorrow, Tuesday, August 8th. President Okufuado is on a three-day tour of the Western region. Moves to avert the felling cocoa trees for rubber plantations. Good evening and welcome to our newscast, News Hour, live on GBC 24 and Ghana Television. My name is Emmanuel Amagashi. And I am Barbara Gezi. With us to do the sign language translation is Robert Fimpong Manso. And now to our first story. All is set for Kenyans to go to the polls tomorrow, Tuesday, August 8. The Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission says it has deployed logistics and voting materials to the 290 constituencies across the country. The front runners of the elections are President Uhuru Kenyatta and former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. All is set in Kenya as 19.6 million people go to the polls to exercise their franchise. The Eastern African economic powerhouse with a population of 45 million is bent on ensuring that there will be no violence as was witnessed in 2007. Though there has been some skirmishes here and there which has claimed some lives, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission has assured the nation and the world that Kenya will not derail the democratic gains made over the past decade. Political analysts have described the August 8 elections as a super showdown between the President Uhuru Kenyatta and former Prime Minister Raleigh Odinga. Interestingly, the two contestants have had their fathers in the driving seat as President and Vice President just after independence on 12 December 1933. Uhuru Kenyatta's father, Jomo Kenyatta, was the President, while his Vice President was Jeramogi Oginja Odinga. But the two first leaders fell out. In 2012, the two sons of the first President Uhuru Kenyatta and Vice President Odinga locked horns for the presidency, and Uhuru Kenyatta had 6.3 million votes, while his opponent secured 5.1 million votes. This is the fourth time Rally Odinga is contesting to be president, and if he succeeds, then he will be the first to defeat an incumbent. Mr. Rally Odinga's party, which is an alliance of opposition parties called the National Super Alliance NASA, has a running mate in the person of Kalonzo Musuyoka, who was vice president to former president Arab Moe and Wai Kibaki. On the contrary, the running mate of President Uhuru Kenyatta, who is a deputy president, William Ruto, was a member of Radio Dinga's party in 2007 elections with 10 violent. The main theme running through the campaign is the economy and corruption. On security, about 150,000 personnel have been deployed to maintain peace and order during and after the elections. The Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission says there are a total of 11,330 candidates contesting for elective seats. 261 aspiring for the county woman member of National Assembly, 183 for governor positions in the 47 counties, 9,142 for member of county assembly, 263 aspiring for the 67 Senate seats, 1,473 aspiring for the 290 members of parliament seats, and 8 for the presidency. The numbers alone indicate that indeed the stakes are high, and this explains why many have fled the urban areas to the hinterlands. But the main presidential candidate Uhuru Kenyatta and Raleigh Dinga have pledged that Kenya will not tow the path of violence as it happened in 2007. Perhaps nature have heard the pleas of Kenya, and on the eve of the elections, the country will be one of the few countries in the world that a lunar and solar eclipse will be visible. The five hour eclipse will be seen from 15.50 pm to 20.50 pm GMT. Besides these, even the meaning of the name of the country, Kenya, which in the Kikui language is called Kere Nyanga, imply mountain of whiteness, and the capital Nairobi, which in Maasai translates as to cool water, are enough messages for the stakeholders, including the parties, the electoral commission, security forces, the judiciary, and the entire Kenyan population to ensure that Kenya will go through this process safe and sound. Edward Nyakon, reporting from Nairobi. And that was our correspondent, Edward Nyako. Many call it the make or break elections, and Kenyans go to the polls tomorrow to elect a president and governess. It is the incumbent, President Uhuru Kenyatta, pitted against opposition leader Raila Odinga. GBC 24's Napoleon Atukito analyzes the Kenyan elections. East Africa's most powerful economy, Kenya, is at crossroads. The litmus test of Kenya's democracy is here. The August 2017 elections 
promise fireworks, but with dynamics that will produce one result. It is the single unpredictable outcome that will determine the implications of the elections, the future of Kenya, and the resonance on the volatile East Africa region. The combatants in the Kenyan political ring are the familiar faces. The array match is responsible for the sensation that has gripped the country and redirected international focus to Kenya. Incumbent President Uhuru Kenyatta versus a former Prime Minister Rayla Odinga. The historical antecedent of their rivalry is interesting. Uhuru's father, Jomo Kenyatta, was Kenya's first president. His vice president was Rayla Odinga's father, a chieftain from the Leo tribe in Kenya called Jamamogi Uginga Odinga. The Kenyatta's hail from the Kikiyu tribe supposedly forming about 20% of Kenya's population. The entry of Rayla Odinga in the contemporary politics of Kenya has caused a stir and challenged the status quo of the dominant, dominant parties, parties since independence in 1964. Having stirred up the honest nest, Kenya slid into her worst violence in 2007 as Rayla Odinga was a judged loser of that year's election to the then incumbent Mwai Kibaki. In 2013, Rayla Odinga lost to Uhuru Kenyatta, who, as an opposition leader, had shot to fame and won sympathy over alleged harassments and solidarity with the masses. His Jubilee Alliance comes up against the National Super Alliance of Rayla. The uneasy road to the polls has seen the murder of the IT head of Kenya's electoral body. The security forces are said to have turned away some observers. The head of the Commonwealth Observer Team, former president of Ghana, John Mahama, was perhaps selected for the job as his concession in an electoral defeat is the example Kenya needs to drain out the tension. Meanwhile, the result of the election has regional ramifications. Rayla Odinga favors Kenyan troops' withdrawal from the AU mission in the hotbed of Somalia sitting next to Kenya geographically. If that happens, the Islamic militant group Al-Shabaab might regain control of territory and impose insecurity in the region. A win for Rayla Odinga could also promote regional trade and integration as the region's other vibrant economy, Tanzania, has adopted trade protectionist policies against Kenya. Uhuru supporters say Kenya need continuity for policies to take root. On the other hand, those rooting for Rela calls for a change for a new direction. The issues facing Kenyans today are basic food, clothing and shelter. Napoleon Atukitu reporting. Kenya's Electoral Commission has assured that contingency plans are in place for the thousands of polling stations across the country without internet connectivity. Out of the 40,883 polling stations nationwide, 11,155 have been identified as having no network. Kenya is holding its breath as the blaring speakers of the election campaign cars finally fall silent ahead of Tuesday's vote. Ten years ago, there was terrible post-election ethnic violence in the country, which nobody here wants to see repeated. But with opinion polls predicting a very close race between incumbent President Uhuru Kenyatta and opposition leader Raila Odinga, there are fears there could be trouble ahead. What happens to Kenya is less about who wins the elections and more about how those who lose take their defeat. The success of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, IEBC computerized voting system, is key to the process being considered free and fair. And let's go to the Ashanti region now. A 31-year-old man, Kwabina Jemai, popularly known as Ajingo, met his untimely death when he was allegedly shot by members of the anti kalamse Task Force Christian Operation Vanguard on Sunday. The incident occurred at about 4.30 p.m. at Enyuma Dukrum, a suburb of Obuasi municipality. Eyewitnesses have refuted the claim by the spokesperson for the anti kalamse Task Force that Kwabna Jemai was hit by a stray bullet. 
In addition, they say it is not true that the deceased engaged the security men in fire exchanges. An eyewitness, Adwa Safwa, narrated what she saw. We had a gunshot. We had wanted to come out to catch a glimpse of what was happening. And we saw soldiers gathered around here who stopped us from coming out. We also saw a man lying in a pool of blood. GBC 24's team in the Ashanti region visited the scene and reports of blood stains there. Some residents alleged they were subjected to abuse by some of the security men, including the Animedu Chrome Unit Committee chairman, who was allegedly assaulted with gun butts when he tried to find out from the tax force reasons for the attack on the community. A resident of Animedu Chrome, Pabna Asiedu, spoke about the ordeal. <laughs> When I returned from a funeral, a soldier instructed me to sit in the muddy water, and I did. The family of the late Kobnajima is calling for thorough investigations into the incident. The deceased, a single parent, left behind a 15-year-old daughter. President Akufuado is on a three-day tour of the Western region. While in that region, the president will pay a courtesy call on the chiefs and people of the northern part of the region to reiterate his commitment to creating the proposed Western Northern Region, North Region. He'll attend a debra of chiefs and people of Vibieni and call on the Omahine and elders of Yoso traditional area. The tour will also include a brief stop at a brief stop at Denchiroboasi the town that caught public attention for the gruesome murder of an army officer, Major Maxwell Mahama. The cutting down of cocoa trees for rubber plantation in the Achim West district of the eastern region is affecting cocoa production. About 2,000 cocoa farmers who have been affected have called on the government to intervene. According to them, the country's target of increasing cocoa production to 1 million tons may not be achieved if action is not taken to avert the situation. Cocoa is the chief agricultural export of Ghana and the country's main cash crop. Ghana is the second largest cocoa exporter in the world and its cocoa cultivation is noted within the developing world to be one of the most modelled commodities. Cocoa is produced in the country's forested areas, Ashanti region, Bunwahafu region, Central region, Eastern region, Western region and Volta region. The crop year begins in October when purchases of the main crop begin with a smaller mid-crop cycle beginning in July. The cocoa sector contributes 4.22% of gross domestic product GDP, 30% of export earnings. Ghana's desire to increase cocoa production has suffered a major setback as 40% of all cocoa trees in Ghana are not productive. The country targets to increase production to 1 million tons by 2020 from the current annual output of 800,000 tons. But the crop has been affected by swollen shoot disease coupled with activities of illegal miners which has destroyed cocoa farms. Most cocoa trees have also been cut to replace rubber plantation. Cocoa farmers in the Achim West district are worried about the situation. 
the land belongs to the chiefs. So it was the chiefs who leased the land to the, this rubber plantation. And even if there is something, you need to call them, sit down and dialogue. Dan Ryder pulling down uh, this whole cocoa tree. Once the cocoa is the number one foreign exchange of the nation. Or is it the rubber who is the number one foreign exchange, uh, exchange earner for the nation? So I think, I think they should, they should concentrate on the farm, the cocoa first, and take the farmers into consideration. Rubber is one of the most commonly used plant products in virtually every industry, from tire industries to aviation, health, education, sports to engineering. Rubber is in high demand. The global demand for natural rubber has compelled some farmers to go into rubber plantation, thereby cutting cocoa trees for rubber plantation. According to the cocoa farmers, some chiefs and landowners force them to sell out their cocoa farmlands for rubber plantation, and this is a threat to cocoa production in the country. Agricultural experts say it will also lead to food shortage if measures are not taken to reverse the trend. They explained that unlike cocoa, rubber cannot be cultivated simultaneously with other staple foods such as cassava. Some beneficiaries of the Cocoa Life program in West Achim say the program has empowered them to adopt good agricultural practices to increase production. The cocoa farmers are given free cocoa hybrid seedlings for cultivation and rewarded according to the tons of cocoa they produce in a season. The award uh, for us is almost about $3.5 million. It's based on what they have produced and that particular award is to encourage or build the capacity of the farmers to be able to not uh, be dependent on cocoa life but not to and also not to wait for cocoa life to come and do something for them but to use that to also improve and expand their farms it's not for North district for example there are 41 communities who are members of cocoa life in every community there is a fiscal infrastructure and they pay from their award that we give them some of the cocoa farmers say though rubber plantation seems lucrative they are not moved by that. They believe that the knowledge and skills they have acquired from the cocoa program and the free distribution of the hybrid cocoa seedlings will help them to increase production to meet global demand. They called on the government to intervene to keep the felling of cocoa trees for our plantation in the area. The Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. John Peter Amewu, has directed officials of the Lands Commission across the country to halt the sale of state lands with immediate effect following the indiscriminate disposal and sale of such lands to private individuals at very cheap rates. At the inauguration of the Volta Regional Lands Commission, the minister said the sale of state lands is affecting the execution of government projects. Recently, there were concerns over the decision of the Volta Regional Lands Commission to lease strategic government lands to private individuals in what the commission claimed was an infilling exercise. In the last eight years, the Volta region has faced difficulties over land title administrations where lands were sold so cheaply. Consequently, the Volta Regional Minister, Dr. Archibald Lecha, held a press conference to register his concern about the situation, which he said is negatively affecting the developmental agenda of the region. The situation, the regional minister said, denies government installations that are yet to begin operations in the region. They are expected to advise and assist in the execution of comprehensive programs for the registrations of title to land throughout the country and in specific reference to the region. The era where members of the commission sit together instead of advising on government and local authorities and traditional authorities on relevant development projects, they decided to share lands among themselves as thing of the past. The commission is made up of representatives of the various statutory bodies, including the Regional House of Chiefs, the Ghana Bar Association, the Town and Country Planning Department, the Ghana Institute of Surveyors, the Ghana National Association of Farmers, fishermen and a representative each from the municipal and district assemblies. Lands and Natural Resources Minister Mr. John Peter Amewu charged the 30-member board to put in measures to resolve protracted land disputes in the region. The rationale for aggressive disposing of government land for private political interest 
can no longer be allowed to continue. But the practices where a clique of few cartel involving politicians, political parties, people who consider themselves rich, fly over, fight over, dip their hands to government lands, can no longer continue under the presidency of His Excellency Nana Adodankwa Kufari. The members of the commission were sworn in by Justice of the whole High Court. Specially permitted by law. Specially permitted by law. So help me God. So help me God. The commission is chaired by Mama Jiduasi of Gui Abansi in the Gui traditional area of the Hohoi municipality. She said the board will remain committed to effective land administration in the region. Traditional authorities and civil society organizations have been educated on the Local Governance Act 936 the revised composite budget and functions of the district, municipal and metropolitan assemblies. The program was organized by the Center for Local Governance Advisory in collaboration with LogNet and supported by the Interministerial Coordinating Committee in Takradi in the Western Region. The sensitization program was to highlight the major challenges in the local governance law. It brought together civil society organizations traditional authorities and the media to be abreast of issues in the amended Local Governance Act. The participants were taken through the Local Government Act 936 of 2016, the revised planning and budgeting guidelines for MMDAs, demarcation of areas of authority of sub-district structures and instruments that establish the Metropolitan Assembly. A local governance expert Dr. Eric Odro Osai said, after going through the act, it became necessary for the major changes to be done to help traditional leaders easily understand it. Previously, we had most of the laws duplicated. They, are, they were scattered. So if you are going to a local government meeting, you need about 10 laws to, to be carried to follow you. But now, we have put all of them together to become one consolidated law. So if you have the Local Governance Act, you have the Common Fund in it, you have the Office of the Head of Local Government Service in it, you have the planning systems in it, you have the internal audits in it, you have accounting in it. So it is a way of consolidating all the laws so that we can have one document on local governance. The Deputy Executive Director of the Centre for Local Governance Advocacy, Madame Gladys Gilliam Nue Dutete said, the programme will help the traditional authorities to work hand in hand with the MMDAs to accelerate the development in their areas. We believe that the two of them have to come together to push the district assemblies forward. Without them understanding the content of the new law, they cannot cooperate effectively with the MMDAs. One of the chiefs was not happy that Portions containing the rules of traditional rulers were taken out in the new act. Join us for the business segment of the news. I'm Dorothy Ajimai. Members of the Ghana Israel Business Chamber have met in a crowd to discuss opportunities and incentives to attract foreign capital. The chief executive of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Mr. Yofi Grant, said the aim is to make the Ghanaian economy business friendly for investors. The Ghana Israel Business Chamber was initiated by the Israeli ambassador in collaboration with the private sector partners in Ghana and Israel. It consists of companies, individuals, business associations and international development agencies with an interest to promote and participate in trade and economic activities between Ghana and Israel. Members of the chamber met to discuss and identify opportunities and challenges in doing business in Ghana, key projects initiated by government and incentives for investors in Ghana. The chief executive of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, GIPC, Mr. Yofi Grant, says government is set to create incentive structures to allow inflow of foreign capital. Some of the things that we are going to suggest is uh, uh, creating what we call uh, golden visas. So if you invest a certain amount, then maybe you have automatic stay. If you invest another category of bond, then maybe we can allow for you to get a Ghanaian passport, uh, such that you are really participating in situ. If you uh, institute or establish your regional office for West Africa in Ghana, 
maybe we'll give you a 10-year ten, ten tax break, you know, to encourage you to stay, on condition that you create a certain number of, of jobs or you employ a certain number of Ghanaians. The Israeli ambassador to Ghana and Liberia, Mr. Amimel, lauded trade between Ghana and Israel and encouraged Ghanaian investors to invest in their own country. When I spoke with the Ghanaian businessmen, many of them told me we have lots of investments in Dubai, in the UK. In I said, why, why, you know, you, you are all... You, all of you want so much that Ghana would be a developed country, but yourself, you prefer to invest your money somewhere else. So how can it help Ghana to develop? It is your responsibility as Ghanaians to, to invest in Ghana. Inadequate infrastructure to process gas from the country's third oil and gas field, Sankofa Jinyame, could affect the country's revenue generation. At a media interaction in Accra, the chief executive of the Ghana Gas Company, Dr. Benasante, said gas from the Sankofa Jinyame will be channeled through the gas, Ghana gas pipelines to fuel thermal plants for power generation. Ghana Gas Company is mandated to operate infrastructure required for the gathering, processing, transporting and marketing of natural gas resources. Ghana Gas has also built an offshore pipeline which links gas from the Jubilee and Ten Fields as well, with an onshore processing capacity of 150 million standard cubic feet per day. Wet gas is processed into lean gas and segregated into various commercial fractions. Outlining his vision for the company, the chief executive of Ghana Gas Company, Dr. Benasante, expressed worry about the frequent breakdowns of the Jubilee FPSO and the impact on gas supply to the Ghana Gas Company for power generation. Now the oil that we have, that bulk oil, is what we put into various commercial fractions as in LPGs, condensates and pentanes, 90% of it. And the rest, the 10%, we actually convert into the liquids. Currently, Ghana Gas handles and transports gas that accounts for close to 600 megawatts of power in the western region. Ghana Gas currently provides 50% of LPG demand in Ghana. He explained that infrastructure expansion, personnel development and community engagement are the three key objectives of the Ghana Gas Company. We have to focus less on where we have come from and focus more on where we want to go together. And we intend to continue to be that rallying force for that community. Dr. Asante said measures have been instituted to protect the pipelines. We, ha we have to do some work on the regulated metering um, station, and I think we'll be ready to supply the customers who have now come on that pipeline. The chief executive of Ghana Gas Company is optimistic that facilities will be expanded to improve the company's operations. You're watching the business segment of News Hour. Moving on on the interbank market, the dollar is trading at 4 CDs, 37 pesos. The pound sterling is also selling at 5 CDs, 70 pesos. And the euro is also selling at 14, 5 CDs, 14 pesos. On the commodities market, light crude is selling at $48.95 per barrel and cocoa at $2,002 per ton. Gold is also going for $1,256.30 an ounce.
And that's it for the business segments. Coming up is the health segments. Please just stay. Time now for the health segment. Eight health facilities in Amansia West districts of the Ashanti region have received medical items worth $3.5 million. The medical equipment and supplies are to augment quality health delivery to the people of Amansia West and its environs. Amansia West District is one of the 27 districts in the country with Mansung Kwanta as its district capital. The district is located in the southwestern part of the Ashanti region and shares common boundary on its west with Atrima district and Busumchu district on its northern part. The district has 14 chips compound and 24 health facilities. Over the years, poor roads in the district have affected the provision and access to quality health care. The road to the St. Martin's Catholic Hospital, Agroyesum, for example, is in a very bad state and thus hampers health care delivery. The St. Martin's Catholic Hospital, Agoyesum, is one of the major referral hospitals in the district, noted for the treatment of brewery ulcer, hemorrhagic fever, and telemedicine treatment, among other piloted health projects within the district. It is among the eight beneficiary health facilities to benefit from the $3.5 million hospital equipment and supplies from Asanko Gold Mine in partnership with Project Cure, a U.S.-based NGO. Project Cure has over the years supported families and patients in 130 countries across the world. The medical superintendent of St. Martin's Catholic Hospital, Dr. Ofuri Amanfo, said the donation is timely as it will support the delivery of health care in the district and beyond. He, however, lamented about the poor road network which impedes smooth running of the facility. The manager in charge of operations for Asanko Gold Mines, Charles Amwa, called for the judicious use of the supplies. I'm hopeful that this and medical supplies will energize and define a new health delivery culture of our health services professionals, thereby leading to mutually beneficial relationship for Asanko Gold Mine, the health facilities, and our adjoining communities. The other seven hospitals will also receive fatal dupla equipment autoclaves, ICU beds, vital signs monitoring equipment, and other lab equipment. Health facilities in Accra have started administering polio vaccines to children throughout the country. Nurses at the Adabraka Polyclinic confirmed that they had received the vaccines and said about five children had been administered with the vaccines as at Monday 7th August when the team visited the hospital. Nurses at the La Polyclinic also confirmed receiving adequate vaccines. The country was hit by a shortage of polio vaccines due to government's indebtedness to UNICEF, the international body that procures the critical vaccine, according to the manager for the National Expanded Program on Immunization, EPI, Dr. George Bunsu, enough vaccines have arrived and are being dispatched to the regions. The second consignment is expected next month. Polio is a highly infectious disease caused by a virus and mainly affects children under five years. It invades the nervous system and can cause total paralysis in a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. Segments coming up shortly is the international news. Hello, good evening. Let's talk sports. I'm Theophilus Sampa. The Ghana police men and women's handball team continued their good run in the ongoing Greater Accra Handball League. They beat Cantonment Youth in a close contest by 26 points to 24 and 37 points to 33. The Ghana prison handball court was the venue for one of the matches in the 15-week-old Greater Accra Handball League, a clash was between the Cantonment Youth and the Ghana Police Service. 
It was an action-packed encounter as both sides were keen on picking the three points at stake. League leaders, the Ghana police, were aiming at consolidating their lead at the summit of the table. For cantonment youth, a win would propel them to the fourth place. The back-to-back -back action saw the police side winning by just two points, 24 points to 26. In the men's class, police dominated from where their ladies left off. They also won by a five-point gap, 32 points to 37. Um, we always beat them by a big margin, so we underrated them and they have given us a tough match. Today's game, I don't know what even came because we didn't even know we could play this much better, but we tried and it was, it was okay for us and we know next time we're going to beat them. Today it was, it was like the small girls, they are moving faster than our ladies and more of our uh, senior players, they are, not, they are not feeling fine. So at first we asked the juniors to go first, but we could see that no, they cannot play. So we have to put the seniors inside at the second half. That's why the, the margin was too closer like that. Today they use experience to beat us. Physically, we are very fast. Skilled, we are there, but they use experience. So we are just, we are just happy we want to make a surprise, a shift on the league table. But so unfortunately, uh, in the dying minutes, we lost one or two balls to the police team. Here are results of other matches played. Men, Prisons 46, Rennie Joe 19, Lekman 31, Lego Nice 36, Asunjay 26, Police 24, Hostak 24, Fire 29, Cantonment U 32, Police 37. In the Women's Division, Hostak 32, Fire 23, Prisons 39, Rennie Joe 17, Cantonment 24, Police 26. The league continues on Thursday, the 10th of August. Turning attention to hockey where trustees of SNIT put up a show on March the 11th of the ongoing Greater Accra Safoda Hockey League. They beat Ackman by 10 goals to nil. The Greater Accra Safoda Hockey League entered March the 11th at the weekend. In the youth division, second place Kaswa Heroes clashed with fourth place Young Financiers. The financiers in the green jersey took the game to the host. They battled them square. On the 11th minute, Safo Philip opened the scoring for the Kaswa lads. Young financiers regrouped and cancelled the lead through Ousu and St. Elliot on the 15th minute. Just under a minute, young financiers made it two goals to one through Boateng Kelvin Ewuku. The encounter ended two goals to one. In the women's division, Reformers from the Ghana Prison Service welcomed the extinguishers from the Ghana Fire Service. The end-to-end -end action saw the extinguishers winning by three goals to one. The result means reformers are third on the league log with nine points in a game in hand, same as extinguishers who are fourth. Here are results of other matches played. In the men's division, trustees 10, Ark Men 0, Ex-Checkers 10, Lego Knight 1, Police 4, Reformers 0. In the women's division, GRA 1, Police Ladies 2, Reformers 1, Extinguishers 3. In the youth division, Kaswa Heroes 1, Young Financiers 2. In the master's class, Safoda 4, Citizens International 0, Golden Stakes 2, Multi Stakes 6. Here are the standings after March Day 11. In the master's division, Safoda are leading with 19 points from 7 games, Multi Stakes are second with 11 points from seven games. NDK financiers with two games in hand are third with nine points. Golden Stakes are fourth with five points and a game in hand. Citizens International are fifth with just a point from six games. In the women's division, GRA are occupying the summit with 23 points from nine matches. Police are second with 18 points from seven matches. Reformers are third with nine points from seven matches. Extinguishers are fourth with nine points from games. Arc ladies are fifth with nine points from seven matches, and Royal Ambassadors are sixth with no points from seven matches. In the men's division, GRA are leading with 23 points from nine games. Trustees are second with 22 points from nine games. Arc checkers are third with 21 points from 10 games. Police are fourth with 17 points from nine matches. Reformers are fifth with nine points from ten matches. Arc men are sixth with three points from ten matches. And Lego Knights are bottom with zero points from nine matches.
in the youth division, Real Ambassadors are leading with 17 points from seven matches. Kaswa Heroes follow with 11 points from seven games. Tema Mahian with a game in hand are third with 10 points. Young Financiers are fourth with 10 points. Ag Boys are bottom with no point. The league continues at the Theodosia Okuhoki Stadium in Accra. That's all for sports. Entertainment is next. And this segment is brought to you by Cowbell. Now, theater lovers were treated to an adaptation of I Told You So, a 1970 Ghanaian movie performed on stage at the Accra International Conference Center. The play was performed in Fante and directed by Abdul Karim Hakib. <laughs> The play, I Told You So, tells a story of a cunning uncle of Rosina who plots with her mother to marry her rough to a rich man. Jones, who played the rich man, left Nigeria to his hometown in search for a wife. <laughs> He finally meets Rosina, but her father did not like the idea of his daughter marrying a rich man. Rosina's mother and uncle objected the idea of the father, allowing her to make a choice. Rosina finally got married to Jones, but during their reception, Jones was arrested for a crime he had committed and bolted. Who is Krebner Jones? I am Jones. You are Jones, eh? You are under arrest. What am I doing? I say you are under arrest. Rosina. <laughs> the director of the play, Abdul Karim Hakib, shared reasons for adapting the movie. I told you so it's a classical play, it's a legendary play that every Ghanaian resonates with. And Ghana is 60. So we feel that we need something that would bind the people of Ghana together. And that is why we said, let's reach within our culture and pick something that everybody can relate to. So that is why we're doing I Told You So. The I Told You So movie is described as one of the classical Ghanaian movie of all time. I saw my culture I should and police investigators on the case of hip life artist Eugene Ashi, known in showbiz as Wise's alleged exposure of his manhood during a performance, failed to appear in court for cross examination on the main witness statement provided for evidence. Detective Edward Odame could not make it to court because he was on another assignment. And the segment was brought to you by Kindness Cowbell. The weather report is next.
And this is where we draw the curtain on News Hour. The late edition is at 10 p.m. Have a very good evening.